We are up to mitzvah number 81, and this is similar to the mitzvahs we've talked about in the past, in the recent past, relative to judgment. And mitzvah number 81 is to not corrupt the judgment of a wicked person. If you're a judge and one of the litigants is a known criminal, a known crook, a known wicked person, someone who violates the Torah, and you may think, well, after all, they're a crook, they're a good for nothing, I could tweak the judgment a little bit so that they lose, that would be a violation of Torah, because you as a judge are not allowed to corrupt the judgment of a wicked person. And the verse to this effect is from Exodus chapter 23, verse 6. It says you should not corrupt the judgment of a poor person in his conflict. And the Talmud says, wait a minute, why would you think that you could corrupt the judgment of a poor person? Does it make sense? You should make a poor person even poorer? Says the Talmud, no. When it's talking about a poor person, it's referring to a poor person in matters of spirituality. In matters of spirituality. If someone is poor in mitzvos, and you may think, you know, they're a wicked person, it's okay for them to lose money. Says the Torah, you should not corrupt the judgment of a poor person to steal from them. The Ram tells us, if you are a judge, and before you come two litigants, one of them is a righteous person, an upstanding person, a good person, a trustworthy person, an honest person. And the other one is a known crook. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's a good for nothing. And you know you would never trust a word that he says. You'd never go into a business venture with him. Whenever he tells you something, you're a little bit suspicious, a little bit dubious. This guy seems to be lying. Nevertheless, when they come before you in judgment, you must treat them exactly equally. And the Ram tells us, Even someone who we would normally suspect of being a liar, when it comes to judgment, we must treat them equally. And the insight is, even though logically, we must assume that this person is going to behave like they normally behave, and we would be even allowed and entitled to view them as a liar. And like we spoke about in the past, you have to judge everyone favorably unless they are known to be someone who's untrustworthy. So in the normal circumstances, you would not be required to believe what he's saying. But in a courtroom, there are certain rules. There are certain protocols. And one of the protocols is that the judge cannot bias his perspective. He has to judge them equally. He has to view them as being completely equal. And the way I like to think of this is kind of like the business concept of a Chinese wall. We have to be able to separate our different interests, our competing interests, our competing desires, our competing perspectives, and we have to sequester them from each other. So we may have certain feelings, certain inclinations, certain tendencies, certain biases relative to this person. In other situations, in other circumstances, we would not be required to believe that person. Nevertheless, when it comes to a courtroom, we have to separate away those other feelings. We have to table those feelings, and we have to judge them with a complete blank slate. You wouldn't do a business deal with him. You wouldn't be so delighted if his son wants to marry your daughter. That family is a little bit suspicious. But as a judge, you must operate under the rules of a completely impartial third party, and you are swayed solely by the evidence and the merits of the case. When it comes to a courtroom, nothing else about the previous history of the litigants can surface. You must only take into account the merits of the case as they're presented before you, and you cannot allow the other perspectives of what you think regarding these various individuals, that cannot surface, that has no place in the courtroom. And I think along these lines there is a general idea that with regards to the courtroom, it's its own little world and it has its own rules and it follows its own protocols. And if a given case following the rules and the protocols of the court 
it arrives at a certain conclusion. And even though everything is telling you this is the wrong conclusion, and you have all kinds of ancillary evidence and things that are not part of this universe called the courtroom, all that is telling you that the conclusion you came to was wrong, nevertheless, in the courtroom, you follow the rules of justice. And thus, you must go ahead, if the case checks out, you must go ahead and render a ruling that every fiber of you is telling you is wrong. But if it checks out following the protocol, you have to execute the verdict. An example of this, the Mishnah tells us in the book of Sanhedrin, of course, the book that deals primarily with jurisprudence and judicial proceedings, it's talking about someone who was convicted of a capital crime. And despite all the systems in place to try to exculpate and exonerate someone who was accused of such a crime, indeed, they were convicted and they are going to be executed. And the mission is describing what we do, what the court does to such a person. And it says before they execute him, they encourage him to confess, to repent. All those who are executed in Jewish court of law are encouraged to confess. And confession, of course, is part of the repentance process. We want the person before they die to confess. And the theory behind this is that in Jewish jurisprudence, capital punishment is not about punishment. We're not there to punish. It's God's job to punish. What the Torah tells us, the, the meaning, the insight behind the Torah telling us to execute someone, is that that is for their benefit. It's for their benefit because it allows them to achieve forgiveness and atonement. Someone does a sin, their soul has a blemish. And the way to fix that, of course, is with repentance. We're now entering the season of repentance. Today is Rosh Hashanah. We're beginning the season that's going to culminate, of course, in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Repentance, of course, is on everyone's mind. And repentance is about cleansing the soul of its blemishes, purifying ourselves of our misdeeds and missteps. Someone does a grave and heinous sin. Their soul has a, a huge blemish to it. And part of the cleansing process is the Jewish court says, we will help you cleanse that by executing you. And in fact, there is a quizzical law about someone who worships Molech. Molech was a particularly macabre form of idol worship wherein a father would give over their own child to be sacrificed, to be burned alive. Awful stuff that people used to do, just terrible. Now, the law states that this is a crime worthy of capital punishment. If someone gives over their child to the priests of Molech, then they are executed. However, what if a parent gives over two of their children or three of their children to Molech? The law states that they are not executed. The question is obvious. If you kill one of your kids, child sacrifice to Molech, if that's enough to get you executed, and now you've done multiple children of yours, all the more so you should be executed. And the commentaries explain that capital punishment is there to provide atonement. If someone does a sin so unconscionable that there's no possible way for them to achieve even a modicum of atonement, then the court says, okay, we have, no, we have no, nothing to do here. If someone, God forbid, kills one of their kids in child sacrifice to Molech, well, of course, it's a heinous sin and even us executing them, it will not solve the problem completely. But nevertheless, there is a degree of atonement that is feasible and therefore he's executed. But if there are multiple children that the father killed, 
in that instance, it's so heinous and so unconscionable and so irreparable, there's no way to undo any of it. And therefore, that person is not subject to capital punishment. Ergo, a central component of capital punishment is repentance, and therefore, the accused, the convicted, must confess and repent before they are executed. And the Talmud says that if someone does confess and does repent, even though they have done a very heinous crime, nevertheless, they still earn a portion in Olam Abba. They still have a portion in the afterlife. They have salvaged some part of their eternity. That's the Mishnah in Sanhedrin, page 43b. And the Mishnah ends as follows. What if the person does not know how to confess? They don't know. What are they supposed to say? What is the shortened version? What is the concise version of confession? Six words. Tihei mesasi kapara al kol avonosai. Let my death be an atonement for all my sins. And in fact, even when someone is not being executed in a Jewish court of law, the tradition tells us that we ought to confess before we die. And if you open up the sitter, there's a very long version of the confession that we're supposed to say. But if you don't have a sitter open before you, you remember these six words, let my death be an atonement for all my sins. Tihei mesasi kapara al kavonosai. That is the shortened version, the truncated version of the confession. My grandfather, blessed memory, had a student who once witnessed a car crash right in front of them. And there was a massive collision and the people were expelled, the drivers were expelled from the car. And he was like right there and just obviously... It was totally frazzled, and he sees the person in front of him dying on the floor. And he was so shooken up by this that uh, he went to my grandfather, who was, of course, the, the leader of the yeshiva, to speak to him to get some solace. And my grandfather asked him, well, did you say vidui with the person? Did you say the confession with the person? Did he make sure the person, as they're dying, they say the confession? And... The student says, well, confession, I don't know the confession by heart. He says, you have to know the confession by heart. Every person must know the confession by heart because you never know when you are going to die. You don't know that. No one knows that. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be not years from now. But the day will come and we have to be ready. We're supposed to repent the day before we die. Well, when's that? It's today. It's tomorrow. It's the next day. It's every day. The Torah is teaching us that we must always be in a mindset of what condition am I in if I have an audience with the Almighty right now? You have to always be ready for that because then you'll make sure your affairs are in order, not just your will and last testament, but also your spiritual affairs are in order. You are ready for showtime. You're ready to present your credentials to the Almighty. Everyone has to know Vida by heart. An amazing thing that my grandfather told his student. You have to know it because you never know when you'll say it with someone else. Maybe you'll say it by yourself. Who knows? That is a mystery that only the Almighty knows when a person is going to die. Side point, it's important for us to know the Vidui by heart. So someone's being brought to be executed and they are encouraged to confess and to repent. And to spare a little bit of their soul, they will be granted a portion of Omaba. And then the mission tells us like this. Suppose the accused, the convicted, knows that he was framed by the witnesses. He knows for certain that the crime that he was convicted for, he never did. He's innocent of this crime. What does he say then? So the Mishnah brings a machlokas, brings a dispute. Says Rabbi Yehuda, if he knows he was framed, he should say the following. Let my death be an atonement for all my sins, except this one. This one I didn't do. For this one, I'm innocent. For this one, I was framed. I was falsely accused of this. That is what a person should say if they know they were framed, says Rabbi Yehuda. 
And the sages responded to him, that's a bad idea. Because then you'll have someone who indeed was guilty of the crime, but wants to save face and will say, Tehemi sasi kapara al kol avonosai, let my death be an atonement for all my sins, except this one, and they'll save face. And I was like, oh my gosh, he was falsely accused. He was framed. But really, he did commit that crime. And he's not going to have atonement for it. And therefore, it's a bad idea. No, you just say, let my death be an atonement for all my sins. That's the Mishnah. And the Talmud, a page later, Sanhedrin 44b, tells us a story. Tanar the rabbis taught. There was a story. A person who was about to be executed. And he makes a proclamation. And he says, if I committed this sin that I was convicted for, let my death not be an atonement for my sins. And if I did not do this crime, then let my death be an atonement for all my sins and let all of Israel and the court be cleansed of all their sins and let these witnesses live in ignominy forever and they'll never be forgiven for any of their sins. And the Talmud says that the witnesses got spooked. They said, oh my gosh, what did we do here? <laughs> we we framed the guy, maybe we got a payoff, we got we had a vendetta against them, we don't like him, we were paid, but now he is making a declaration we should never forgive him for any of our sins forever. They run to court and they say, We want to retract our testimony. We want to withdraw our testimony. We we made it up, we framed the guy, he's innocent. The court says, oh my gosh, what do we do? We're about to execute an innocent man. We are about to execute an innocent man. But here's the problem. There are only two ways that a verdict, a guilty verdict, can be undone. Either if we have a second set of witnesses that prove that the first set of witnesses made it up. A second way that we can undo a verdict after it was already delivered is if there is material evidence, either in the case or a new angle of the halachic question, that surfaces. But the witnesses cannot give testimony and then retract the testimony after the verdict has been delivered. That's the rules. We believe the witnesses in their first statement and not in their second statement when it contradicts their first statement, provided that the verdict has been delivered. So we have a problem here. We know someone is innocent. The witnesses are retracting their testimony. But there is protocol here. And in this universe called the judicial process, it tells us that there are certain ways a verdict can be undone, and that's it. There are no other ways that a verdict can be undone. And the Torah tells us we believe witnesses. And if the witnesses say something and it checks out following all the protocol, well, then we have to execute the verdict as the Torah instructs us. So you'll find this very disturbing. The Talmud says that the sages knowingly executed an innocent man after the witnesses withdrew their testimony and they said, we made it up. Once the verdict has been reached, the protocol must be followed and the only way to undo it is if there's a second set of witnesses or if there's new material evidence in the case, either actual physical evidence based upon the reality of what happened or there's halachic evidence, but the witnesses cannot withdraw their testimony. Says the Talmud that he must be killed, he must be executed, and let 
the burden of responsibility forever be associated with these two witnesses. Once a witness conveys testimony, they cannot retract it and say something which contradicts their original statement. The Torah tells us we believe the first statement and not the second statement. So it's an amazing thing. We know he is lying. And nevertheless, there is judicial protocol that must be followed to a T. The verdict, once it's passed, there's specific ways it can be undone, but the original witnesses cannot withdraw their testimony. Now, on a higher level, just to make everyone's blood stop boiling, because this is something which is very disturbing. This is disturbing. This is a system not working as intended. The commentaries explain that when the judges are sitting in court, and this is a righteous court, they're doing everything properly, the Almighty is with them. The Almighty is alongside them. And the verdict that they reach is the verdict that God wants them to reach. So if a Jewish court, they do everything right, and they execute an innocent man, we know that the Almighty wanted that person to die in that specific way. Now, why God wanted to do that? We don't know. Is it possible that this person is a reincarnation of someone who needed to die in a specific way? Is it possible this person did a different crime that they weren't caught for, and then they were framed for a crime that they did not do, but the punishment, the execution, for the second crime that was non-existent is really for the first crime that was existent? We don't know why. But what we do know for sure is that when the Jewish court is sitting in session, the Almighty is there. And the result that they reach is the result that the Almighty wanted them to reach. Again, provided they're doing their due diligence and, and they're checking every box and they're uncovering every stone, in that instance, the result is actually the result that the Almighty is desirous of, even though we don't necessarily know how that works. Now, Rashi, in his commentary, he tells us a wild story that's briefly referenced in the Talmud. And we may have spoken about the story in the past, but it's such a crazy story that we'll say it again briefly. It tells that there was a tax collector, a wicked guy who everyone hated, who died. And the same day that he died, a very righteous and pious scholar died as well. And thus there were two funerals on the same day. There was the funeral of the terrible, wicked tax collector that everyone hated and the funeral of the venerated sage that everyone loved. And the whole city came to pay their final respects to the great sage and the tax collector, his family, was burying him. But then a band of marauders attacked the procession and the people scattered in all different directions. And they dropped the beard, they dropped the coffins, and they ran for their lives. And after the threat went away, the funerals proceeded. But the problem was, is that they swapped bodies. In the confusion, the people grabbed the tax collector's coffin, and they thought that was the great rabbi's coffin. And they were all crying and bewailing and giving him a very distinguished funeral. The whole town is paying their respects to this terrible, awful, horrific tax collector. And the family of the tax collector, they are burying the great rabbi, the great sage, in a pathetic procession. And there's one person who noticed that there was a switcheroo, and he was trying to get everyone's attention, but no one was listening to him. There were so many people, there was so much chaos, and he knew alone. He was the one who knew that the bodies or the coffins were swapped and he was very disturbed about this. And if this story sounds strange so far, it gets even stranger. And it says he was so disturbed. This dude was so disturbed. How is it possible? This tax collector that everyone hates that did such terrible things to all the people. He was given such honor. And the great rabbi, the great sage was buried in such a uh, disrespectful in dishonorable fashion. And Rashi tells us that he had a dream. And the great rabbi, who was buried as if he was the tax collector, 
appears to him in his dream. And he says, don't worry about me. Come, I'll show you what's happening to me right now in heaven. He sees all this beautiful honor that he's been accorded in heaven. Oh, and I'll show you where the attached letter is. He's in hell. He's roasting in hell. Things worked out okay. What happened? There was once a time that I failed to stand up for the honor of a righteous person. And that's why I was punished. And this person, he once made a party for a big official. And the official didn't show up. And he took the food that he prepared for the party and gave it to the poor people. And therefore, he did one mitzvah, I did one sin, and the way the Almighty kind of paid it up, the way the Almighty made it fair, is that he got the honorable funeral, and I got the dishonorable funeral. But ultimately, things are the way they are intended. And then, the student who's having this dream, he's so disturbed by what he saw that's happening to the tax collector, He says, when will this person finally get out of his purgatory? When will he get out of Gehenim? When will he stop being judged so severely? So the great rabbi responds to him, when Shimon ben Shetach dies, and he goes in his place. Now, if we don't know who Shimon ben Shetach is, that sounds okay, who's the Shimon ben Shetach guy? But the problem is that Shimon Shetach was the greatest rabbi in the world at the time. He was the greatest rabbi in the world. He was one of the Zugos. He was the head of the Sanhedrin. And now, this sage is telling his student of the dream that Shimon Shetach is destined to replace the tax collector in hell. What's going on? Why? Well, why? Because there are a group of Jewish witches performing witchcraft in a way that's forbidden by the Torah, and this great rabbi, Shem Shetach, is not stopping it. And therefore, in payment, or in punishment, for his lack of stopping this witchcraft, he's going to take the place of the tax collector in hell. So the next morning, the student wakes up, and he's totally frazzled by this dream that he had, and he runs over to Shem Shetach. And Shem Shetach, by the way, He's of the first century before the Common Era. And he runs to Shem Shetach and tells him what he experienced. So Shem Shetach says, okay, I'm taking care of this problem. And Rashi tells us a very dramatic way as to how exactly he managed to take care of the 80 witches. The problem was these women were very gifted in black magic and witchcraft. And of course, these are things that we don't know how they actually work. And we're very dubious whether or not they actually worked at all. But he managed to take care of this problem and quell the problem. And then a relative of these witches was so upset, was so incensed at the great rabbi that they decided to frame the son of Shem Shetach for a crime that he did not commit. And he was being brought to be executed And he made the similar declaration. He says, if I did do this sin, let my death not be an atonement for all my sins. And if I did not do this sin, then let my death be an atonement for all my sins and let these fake witnesses bear the shame forever for executing innocent men. And the witnesses heard it and they tried to retract their statement but to no avail, because you cannot retract your statement if you are a witness. You can't retract it after you say it. There is a judicial protocol, and indeed, the son of Shemeshadach was executed. And this is the idea, more broadly. When you enter a Jewish court of law, there are certain laws that you follow, there are certain protocols that must be followed. And we understand that the Almighty is with them. And the result, the conclusion is the result that God wants. But our job is to follow the rules. Our job is to toe the line. Our job is to do what is our responsibility and not what is not our responsibility. And similarly, in our law here, mitzvah number 81, you have a crook. And the crook comes before you and he's one of the litigants. And under normal circumstances, you would say, this person is a liar. I'm not trusting what they're saying. But you know what? They walk into the court. You must erect a Chinese wall. 
you must treat them completely equally. You cannot bias your perspective in the court based upon what you know is their character outside of the court. And you know what? The result? You do your job. Let God do God's job. We don't know why God operates the way he does. Of course, we have only a a tiny little sliver of, of a window of insight into what's actually happening. None of us know really much about anything, but the money sees everything. And he sees our past, he sees our future, he knows our soul, he knows what our soul needs. He has a complete perspective of everything, and thus he uses the court as another tool to implement his will. And just like we don't ask a question, well, why does God give someone a heart attack? Or maybe we do ask the question. But just as that question has an answer that we don't know why people have different medical results, similarly, the results of the Jewish court are in the hands of God.